In AD 9, Wang Mang, once the powerful prime minister of the Western Han court, overthrew the dynasty and declared himself ruler. The reign of this ambitious but conniving reformer is the interlude between the Western and Eastern Han dynasties. But that he could become emperor in the first place was due to the power vacuum left by a previous emperor. Ari of Han had no children, and though his reign was rocky, he has achieved immortality in modern China due to his devotion to a male lover. Ari originally named Lu Xin, grew up without the presence of his parents. According to his biography in the Han Shu, written roughly a century after Ari's death, his father died when he was only four, and he hardly saw his mother. Instead, he was primarily raised by his grandmother, the formidable consort Fu. At the age of 18, he made a lasting impression on his childless uncle, Emperor Cheng, during a visit to the capital. Ari displayed remarkable knowledge and virtue. An important point was that consort Fu indeed herself and gave substantial gifts to Cheng's most influential advisers, who began singing his praises too. The favorable image won Cheng over. Ari ascended the throne in 7 BC at the age of 20. It was a good start. He successfully reduced the power of the former empress's Wang clan, taking more of a hand in court affairs while keeping capable ministers in his employ. However, he appeared to be heavily influenced by consort Fu, as suggested by the Han Shu. Consort Fu steadily eroded the Wang clan's power base and even managed to secure her position as Grand Empress Dowager. Contrary to established protocols, Emperor Ari's leadership was marked by indecisiveness and frequent shifts in his decisions, contributed to instability at court, as all final decisions rested with him. Then, favoritism reared its ugly head in the form of a male lover named Dong Xian, described in the Han Shu, as a soft and gentle person, skilled at charming people. Originally employed as a private secretary to the crown prince due to his father's court position as a historian, Dong captured Emperor Ari's attention in 4 BC. An emperor with a male lover wasn't unusual. As an historian, Saima Qian notes in records of the Grand Historian, it is not women alone who can use their looks to attract the eyes of the ruler, courtiers and eunuchs can play that game as well. Many were the men of ancient times who gained favor this way. There are sources of rulers taking male lovers since the Zhu dynasty, who were allowed to cheekily flout codes of conduct around their head of state as long as they stayed young and beautiful. By the Han, it was all but a matter of routine, all ten previous emperors of the dynasty had male favorites. The practice of same-sex relationships wasn't confined to the imperial court alone. Brett Hinch argues in his influential and highly readable passions of the cut sleeve that upper-class men were free to take male lovers when the concept of romance was socially flexible, possible with both a man or a woman without the moral stigmas of religion. The practice of emperors taking male lovers continued long after Ari was gone. The custom of a politically influential male consort was so common that court historians would write biographies about them up until the Song dynasty. But Ari was different. Despite the fact that previous Han rulers engaged in relationships with men, they all managed to father heirs. In contrast, Emperor Ari never had any children with his empress. As noted by the Han historian Ban, by nature, Emperor Ari did not care for women. In the space of a year, Dong Xian and his wife, who had several children together, moved into the palace. His relatives showered with titles and influential positions, with an imperial palace equal in size to the emperor's. Constructed in his honor, Dong's power reached dangerous levels. By 2 BC, at the tender age of 22, he effectively controlled all decision-making processes. He held the positions of prime minister, supreme commander of the army, and the capital's security chief. The Han Shu records that all the officials were presenting their affairs to him, underlining his unprecedented authority. Ari would hear no words against him, imprisoning and demoting those who tried to protest Dong's astronomical rise. When Prime Minister Wang Jiu tried to curtail Dong's rise in 2 BC, Ari made Wang commit suicide. Dong's youth among the grey heads stuck out like a sore thumb. According to the Han Shu, a supreme leader called Chanyu of the Xiongnu, attending a banquet with Han ministers, was so impressed that a man so fresh-faced was capable of reaching such a high standing that he told the translator, the Grand Secretary is young, so he should take the place of a great scholar. Ari said that although Dong was young, he had earned his place through his wisdom. The Chanyu rose to his feet and congratulated the Han for having a wise minister. 
the favoritism at court and the unrestrained political and purchasing power of the Fu and Dong families had an impact on the country. In 3 BC, the virtuous minister Bao Xian sent a memorial to the throne that would come to be known as Seven Deprivations and Seven Deaths. It described a world turned on its head, a court that had banished men of virtue and was dominated by lackeys who taxed the common people to the hilt. The world today calls the unwise as able and the wise as unable. Ari did not punish Bao, knowing he was a famous Confucian, but did nothing until an earthquake the next year seemed to confirm divine displeasure at the immorality of the Han court. Ari dismissed several favorites and attempted reform. But Bao Xian's suggestions of curtailing the number of servants and acres of land imperial officials could own was abruptly overruled by imperial favorites. The source material suggests that Emperor Ari's favoritism and his same-sex relationship with Dong Xian had significant repercussions on the Western Han Dynasty. Ari, who suffered from an unknown illness during his short six-year reign, made a fateful announcement on his deathbed in 1 BC, declaring that Dong would succeed him as emperor. However, without the support of his powerful lover, Dong's influence rapidly waned and he was effectively marginalized by the court soon after Ari's passing. Both Dong and his wife were compelled to take their own lives. Ari would have been just another weak ruler at the tail end of one of China's many dynastic cycles, if it hadn't been for the story of the cut sleeve. The kernels of the legend can be found in the Han Shu, Dong Xian, was often in bed with the emperor. When Ari wanted to get up, he did not want to move Dong Xian, but he broke his sleeve and got up. This was the extent of his love and affection. Supposedly, after ministers found out about this mark of love that to avoid waking Dong by moving his arm, Ari cut off his sleeve, this started a fashion trend. Through the dynasties, one of the most common euphemisms for a homosexual has been cut sleeve. Ming and Qing dynasty authors would title erotic homosexual stories as records of the cut sleeve. Police in Republican Beijing would label homosexual behavior as predilection of the cut sleeve. Although the term still occasionally pops up online, it is more an intriguing curio than a challenger to Tongji as the standard modern euphemism. It is intriguing how this incompetent emperor, whose passions have been interpreted in the histories as opening the door to court corruption and dynastic crisis, has been remembered for a tale of passion and love. Today in China, as in many places, homosexuality is merely tolerated rather than accepted, gay clubs can remain open provided they stay out of the public eye. But China's long history of homosexuality gives hope to many in the LGBTQ community, in a country that only removed the orientation from an official list of mental illnesses in 2001. Emperor Ari's legacy isn't all doom and destruction, 